Daniel Zimbrin. Uh, it, yes, it's, it is a bit of an homage to, uh, to Radcliffe Brown, for those of you who are familiar with him. Um, like I said, a light touch, so don't hold me, hold me too, too deep in this. We're going to run this presentation off um, a PDF, so please forgive. It won't have some of the fun little things to it, but we have it, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Lily. Okay, so... Uh, I'll just to orient for today, I'll tell you a little bit about me and how I got to where I am uh, and why I run a company called, or a department called Harmonious Communities. I will give you a quick overview of Radcliffe Brown. All of you are probably far more deeply entrenched in his writing and theory than I am, but, uh, but a light touch. And then I'm going to present one case study from some work I did about a decade ago in marketing and consulting. and. The second thing will really be more of a provocation. So I know OII talks tend to be people presenting very polished, finished work. That is not me. Uh, so let's go with this and um, embrace this as a chance to actually talk and think through something that is very much unfolding in real time, in real lives, and, um, and see if there is a space that we can actually do something more interesting and more compelling. OK, with that in mind, uh, yes, I am. A fairly classically trained cultural anthropologist. I did my undergrad at Chicago. Uh, I actually started as a dual major in chem and econ. I was going to run the World Bank because they were not doing things the right way. Uh, I lost my noodle with too many rational actors in economics and absolutely fell in love with anthropology and never turned back. Studied under Jean Komarov for my honors thesis there. Um, and then went to SOAS, where I had the great fortune of working with, uh, with David Perkin, who I believe is here and, and apparently shows up every once in a while. Um, so he was a phenomenal mentor there. And then went and finished my PhD over at Emory. Um, Emory was a young but uh, really incredibly interesting department. At the time, I chose it deliberately because it was a Ford Field department. Um, I had aspirations of doing medical anthropology. Um, that took a hard turn, and I ended up actually in kinship studies, um, really looking at the experience of teenagers in foster care who were being sent back home to their families. Um, so uh, got a lot of Radcliffe Brown in varying ways through my many adventures. Uh, after I finished, oops, sorry. This is going to be a very interesting way to do a talk. But thank you. Okay, after I finished my graduate career, I taught for about eight years, eight nine years, depending on when you consider starting and finishing. Uh, the first of that was at Stanford, and then over to back to Emory as faculty, and then on to uh, University of Minnesota and Hamlin University up in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, yes, very cold, super cold. Um, uh, a lot of my courses were, I did always teach a sort of kinship and family class, but then really focused on general introduction to cultural anthropology, intro to metanthro, um, and a lot of research methodology classes. My goal was really never to make more anthropologists, but to, uh, to help everybody, no matter what field you study, think a little bit differently about the way you do your own work. Think differently about people. Kind of bring some of what I saw as the magic and power of anthropology into a lot of careers. Uh, we actually did get a lot of anthropologists, but, um, but it was really more intended to be taking a translational course um, and really loved and enjoyed all of that. In 2010, my life took a bit of a turn. I had an opportunity to lead a research team at a global marketing and consulting firm. Um, and as somebody who my passions have always been slightly more applied, um, it seemed to be the right kind of challenge for my life at that point in time. Those are a handful of the brands that I got to play with over five years. Um, it was amazing and exciting and exhausting and so many things um, that I will tell you all about later when we're not on video, but, uh, but a really incredible moment in to really push my thinking about anthropology. Uh, and that's where I came back to Radcliffe Brown, interestingly. Uh, I took, uh, I left there and went to the Rand Corporation, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit policy research organization. I was on the research side of the house for a couple of years and then led their business intelligence group uh, for the remainder of my time there. And then in 2021, um, I was offered the opportunity to come to Toyota Research Institute uh, leading, as we call it, the Department of Harmonious Communities. Um, 
Toyota's corporate global mission, as David said, is actually happiness for all, which is kind of surprising if you don't know the company very well. Um, so we are tasked with actually bringing that to life. So right now we are working on um, projects that are around how do we solve local level conflict and politics over resource allocation when it comes to things like schools and libraries and parks and housing for our homeless population, all of those sorts of things. So that is what my team is deep at right now. You will not see that today, um, but it has been a fairly extraordinary opportunity. I feel like in many ways I'm doing better than running the world. Um, but that is a little bit of, of where I got to. So David, you're not wrong. We're, we're, we're a little bit theory light in the applied world here, but I'm gonna talk to you about how I kind of fell back in love with Radcliffe Brown. Uh, my own work probably took more of a leaning from the Manchester School of studying when things break. Uh, so obviously foster care, my undergrad thesis was um, adolescent cancer patients. Uh, so a lot of my focus had been on things that weren't going the way they should be. Um, and, uh, but, I, but I came back to, to Radcliffe Brown when I was in marketing for one major reason. I want to start by actually, this would be, a, I'm a bit of a storyteller, so follow along with me. We're going to go back to kind of what were the formative years in which he was developing as a scholar and a thinker and a writer, right? So when you think, he was born in 1881, died in the mid-1950s, right? So this was a time of immense sort of global change, right? So you have industrialization, you have the colonial movement, you have a massive missionary movement, you've got trade escalating across the, the globe. So we have this sort of shrinking of the globe that is happening in terms of place. And what was coming out of all of these adventures were travel reports about people and places. And with varying degrees of truth in them, very little typically. Um, but this was a time of sort of a, a, a huge growth in our understanding of what was going on in the world and our ability to experience and engage with all of that. Right, so you had the World Fairs. This is the World Fair in St. Louis in 1904. We literally brought people from their homes and put them on display at the World's Fair, totally out of context, without a lot of explanation. Um, and what I think was driving Radcliffe Brown, when you read a lot of his later writings, is really the sense that, that this is not, not cool, as my teammates said. There was something sort of very unreliable and, and frequently inaccurate to use his own words. We were making caricatures of people rather than actually understanding people's lives and the ways in which they were living and why they were living the ways they were doing. Right? So um, you've all probably read enough social theory from the early 1900s to, to follow along. Is there anyone who, who hasn't covered kind of Victorian anthropology, the rise of early anthropology? Okay. All right. So with all of that in mind, this is the general context in which he was writing. But he was also, to be frank, equally critical of a lot of how early anthropology was developing. And his primary critique is that we were engaging in a lot of um, sort of false history, right? In order to make an evolutionary paradigm of that great chain of being work, you had to make assumptions that weren't warranted by the data. The same with that sort of cultural diffusion model. My family was at the Pitt Rivers today. I love how it's organized because it's just like all the dolls from the world in one little box, right? The, the way that you can kind of connect these themes required some leaps in thinking that he felt weren't really justified in the data. And so he was equally critical of all of this which really pushed him into this idea of how, ooh, I'm gonna get sick of this, okay. How do we actually develop a science of anthropology? What can we actually do to embed some rigor, to embed some comparability across what we're seeing, to really create a framework that allows us to understand and process this vast amount of information that is now circulating in our world, right? That's really what he, you know, to me, was really kind of the brilliance of what he added to do anthropology um, and you know make an observation have a hypothesis go back see if it works right how could we make anthropology a little bit more like chemistry a little bit more like physics something along those lines okay um, and what's funny to me is when you look across ethnographies from this time period they all have a very similar tone to them right Here's the landscape, and here's the language, and here's kinship structures, and 
religion and laws, right? So they all kind of follow this very standard pattern of, of that structural, structural functionalist model of all of these pieces somehow coming together to make sense for why a community or culture or society is the way that it is, right? And so you see this kind of, that's what I talk about when I talk about his, his framework contribution to our discipline, is that idea that all of these parts can hold together and kind of bring some order and so you can look at, you know, whether you're looking at the Azombe or, you know, the new era, you've got an ability to kind of share shared language for how we're going about doing this. Um, and to me, that was kind of the, the, the big, that later proved to be the big contribution and why I went back to him. I am aware social theory has advanced since the 1950s. <laughs> I, I fully agree with all of why there were problems with this, right? But for what it was in terms of processing this sort of vast flow of data, it actually was a really interesting and powerful way to start to say, there's a way that we can chunk up context and there's a way that we can think about this. So now I'm gonna do a hard jump to 2010 and how I got back into this. That's your chart, by the way. Slightly blurry up here, but that's from your book. Um, I actually really liked the way that it kind of blended theory and something that we might think of as a sort of data sciences uh, histogram. Okay, so why did we need this? All right, this was the time in which I had moved out of academia and into consulting, right? So this is all of the, the kind of rise of social media and the development of the internet, right? So all of Facebook went kind of public-ish in 2006. Instagram, I think, was 2009. Twitter was somewhere around in there, right? So you had, all of a sudden, a very technologically smaller world. I am aware not everybody was on this, I get that, but all of a sudden, you had a lot more information. You had the rise of a lot of internet shopping platforms, and so there was a lot of data about human behavior, and people were trying to figure out what to do with it and what it meant and how to process it, okay? So the typical way in which it was processed made me absolutely bonkers, which was these, which are personas. So the way that persona development typically happens, and I would still argue many firms do this today, is you have a demographic, you go and you find a couple of things about them, about how they shop, what they like, Apparently, I need new work-friendly clothes in my life, right? Um, and you pull together these things that look like insights about people, right? The reason I focus on moms is that I was uh, a single mom with two little kids at this time, and every time I saw one of these, I just wanted to hit a wall, right? So I <laughs> think we're just really ridiculously caricature representations of people's lives. Just like we saw in the travel logs, we were seeing this again in these personas because what was happening is teams were going out across the internet and essentially pulling stuff that they thought was important or relevant without any guiding principles, without any guiding theory, and just throwing it up there and saying, I love music and shopping, or there's another one that's about wanting to buy something so I can keep up with my friends and you know, fit in with the crowd. Uh, so these were really almost and in, as much as it may seem relatively innocuous when it's about spaghetti sauce or something, this also forms like banking decisions and life insurance and healthcare. Right? These are driving a lot of very powerful industries as well. And as much as we might laugh at spaghetti sauce or whatever, it's really hard to go through your day without actually engaging with a brand. And so all of the choices that were getting presented, all of the decisions that were getting made are based largely on these kinds of things. And to me, that felt equally as dangerous as running sort of colonial policy based on the travel bond. So that's where we started to di dive in. Oh, maybe this is an easier one for a British audience to understand about why personas tend to be deeply problematic. Um, this is one that's actually been showing up for quite a while. Is that they're actually quite similar and yet completely Unalike. So we used to say, so much data, so little insight, um, was the phrase that we often used. Okay, so 
we literally took a page out of the table of contents <laughs> from this sort of structural functionalist era. I, full disclosure, inherited this system. The woman who had had the role before me, the apologist, used this as a way to justify a longer term field project so she could go across the globe for four months and like study hockey um, by saying that it was really complicated and we had a lot to cover. So she got to, so that's how she was using it. By the time I took the role, it was obviously moving into this big data era and companies were unwilling to fund four month jumps across the globe and really wanted us to figure out how to use data. So my challenge was how do you take a framework like this and actually make it into a compelling data centered, interesting way of understanding people that's not a persona. So that's what I, that's what my task was when I was there. So as with all things, your first step is to figure out what is your data source. Uh, there's actually something called the Survey of the American Consumer. It's done by GFK, which I think is actually, it's based in Cambridge. Um, uh, their global team is based in Cambridge. It's been running since 1979. What I love about this is it is, in addition to being a 120 page survey, they actually do in-home interviews. So they're going through your cabinets and looking at every brand of everything that you've purchased, as well as doing interviews along with this. And the, the, it covers everything from Literally the brand of toothpaste you buy, to the credit cards that you have, to your views on traditional marriage and climate change. It is as comprehensive as you could possibly get in one survey. And um, so we started, it's, it's not a perfect source, but the other thing that's also really interesting about this is that everyone who participates in it willingly participates in it. So the time we were doing this is also, by the way, the time of Cambridge Analytica, which was not voluntary participation, to be clear. But um, so we really, it was important to us that we had a source for our data that was, that, was, that people knew was, was being gathered from them. So that's why we chose this one. Uh, what we did was we actually went through, we dropped the dimension of language from our 10, so we had nine. And then what we did is we went through and kind of thought about each, what are the mid-level theories that actually help us understand what we're seeing in this, right? So our, Converse ours, we have one on symbols here. Uh, and it was really about how do people think of their own bodies as representations in the world? And what do they do in terms of accoutrements like accessories, shoes, clothing, right? So you have a, a second layer of that. And then the third layer were things like houses and cars, big purchase, big ticket items, right? We had one on economy, which actually was much more about how do people get information? Where are they learning? What are they trying to understand? And the flow of information through people, what is trust? How do they do this? Um, our one on um, laws was really about people's attitudes towards authority, resistance, rebellion, and power. And so then what we did is once we kind of came up with our mid-tier theories that we could start to test, we went through that 120-page survey, question by question, <laughs> and laddered them against which dimension we thought it might actually help inform. Okay, are you, is this making general sense? Okay, so what we were trying to do was build a framework about people that was agnostic of any brand or category or service or anything like that, right? So if you take that concept of the, the like structural functionalist, right, we were trying to do that, but at the mid-level, use it as a way to test stuff and not just represent. So how can we see change in dynamics? Um, I worked with, a with an archeologist, a sociologist, and our data sciences team to do all of this. We pulled it together. It was pretty fun. The data scientists then went and did a, a range of different cluster analyses. Um, I would ask you to please ignore some of the names that they've given some of the teams or some of the clusters. Um, I did not choose them. <laughs> but. Uh, but it's what we got, and um, we started to really, these were done individually. We, we ran it up a whole range of ways. There was still work I wanted to do at the end, to be clear, on how to refine some of this. Um, but this is how it then started to spin out. And then what it put out were things like these. This is a heat map. So this is, this is for our client, this is the yellow column. This was a weight loss industry project. All right. So all of these are companies that are in the weight loss space. Right? And so if you look at the demographics of these people who are behind all of this, they're relatively the same. There's a little bit of difference in terms of income or age and, and across every column is a different company that does something in weight loss. 
just to let you guys know. And then the parallel lines are what our dimensions were and the clusters of the dimensions. Okay, does that help visually to make this? All right, so our client came to us, they're like, the problem isn't that people aren't signing up, the problem is that people are signing up and actually not finishing the program. So they were, it was not a money issue for them. The challenge for them is that people would drop out at three weeks, they would drop out at eight weeks, and then they would drop out right before they reached their goal weight. And they were like, what's going on? <laughs> so, also to be clear, this was never the only data that we did, but I'll explain to you quickly how this taught us something about weight loss. When we ran this and we looked at our people, they were pretty different from the other categories. And so we were trying to figure out what was going on. Um, they are staunchly family focused, which actually more is like relationship focused. These are people who prioritize other people in their life, right? Which you can also see up here because they took a we have like multi shopper, multi space shopping, right? So they go to a lot of different stores because they're trying to attend to a lot of different people in their lives, right? This is the mom who will go to. Sainsbury's for one thing and Tesco for another because each kid likes the one from the different store, right? They also really don't like their bodies and really shy away from anything that calls attention to themselves physically, right? Which kind of makes sense in the weight loss industry, but you also do see in other categories people who are really quite fond of like those are these are like your neon day glow sandex crowds over here. This is not you're not them. Um, and what was, and they're also highly regimented, which means like structure routine is very, very important to them because they're juggling a lot of balls. They've got a lot that's going on and they're trying to hold it all together. So what happens is they join the program and then you drop it three weeks because it's really inconvenient for the people who matter to them, right? They drop it eight weeks because, all right, I finally learned your system and it's really inconvenient for the people who actually matter to me. And it's messing up my ability to kind of keep all of these balls in place. Right? And then they drop out before their weight goal because it doesn't actually really matter to me. That number was a random number that I chose, but what actually matters to me is I have my relationships back. Most of what drove people into the program was, was when their weight actually started to impact their relationships. They couldn't wear their wedding ring, they were getting married, uh, they couldn't ride a roller coaster with their kids because they were too big to get into their seats. It was only when they actually had to put themselves first because of their relationships that they actually did. Right, so we were able to get a lot of this picture from this data. We also did interviews. We all joined the program for a month. We tried to figure out what it was. Like we worked with people. We did actually do some social media polls of like, what do people celebrate? What do they talk about? What are the questions they're asking? How do we understand all of this? So this wasn't, like I said, the only data, but being able to tell this story is a very different story than it's a 40-year-old mom with three kids, right? It gives you a lot more understanding and nuance and context about why they might be choosing this program over others and also why they're dropping out, right? Because if this breaks these relationships, they're going to leave. That's the only thing that really drives them. And the only reason they stay in the program is because they put money on the line. Right? They are trying to keep themselves accountable to something that is much more important. So that's what the power of this integrating theory into data allowed us to do and get away from like busy mom Mia who needs better clothes, right? Like that's what we were fighting against at the time. Every time the other thing we actually realized. Sorry, was this from the ABS survey or this is from the yeah. Survey the American Consumer. Uh, oh, I'm going to pass that. And interesting. We also realized you could actually use it for strategic acquisition. Right. So this is a different category. This is insurance. Our client is over here. These are a whole range of other insurance companies. We realized these two companies were matched on four of the nine dimensions pretty closely, and they were different on these two. One of which was about like. I like to talk to people to get information. The other one was I get information from all over the place. I'm on the internet, I'm on my phone, I'm on everything. And the other dimension was, um, was uh, ritual. So our people were much more like routine oriented, the other group was not. Right? So what we told them is if you actually can broaden your internet presence and talk about um, the kinds of things that trigger people to think about changing insurance, you're probably more likely to get that. But when you look at this as a whole category, all of it looks pretty generic, right? So being able to really understand the nuances of what drives people's lives 
was what we were trying. So rather than just like do a broad, enormous way of trying to capture everybody, you can actually be really strategic in how you think about who you're going after and who's most likely to align with you. So it allowed us to, which they did, and it worked. Um, so it allowed us to kind of think very differently about how to advise from a strategic perspective as well. Um, okay, so we had talked about doing a lot of other things with it. Obviously, were there, were there other sort of mid-range theories that we could or should be testing? Um, obviously, data goes back to 1979. Could we get all of it? Could we see how things change over time? Does everything change equally? What things change in different cases? What could we learn from that? Um, and we started to realize after you run a number of these, like maybe not every category actually needs to be in there. And if not, to or are they only relevant for certain kinds of things? You know, it doesn't matter all the time. Um, and then the final thing is really around how do we start to really think about blending in other data sets? So we were supplementing all of this with more traditional qualitative methods. Um, but could we start to pull in clients and data? Could we start to pull in other sorts of larger data sets? And what would that do to the kinds of, to the framework that we had built? So that's where I left it when I left in 2015. And um, but I still think it's one of the more interesting ways that we could see anybody kind of try and tackle how do we talk about people as people, not as consumers, not as users, not as anything like that, but as actual real people with interesting and complicated lives. So I'm going to pull you for, uh, oh, sorry, one more thing. We weren't actually the only people doing this. Nate Silver's group, which is the 538 group that predicts the US elections and predicted the housing crash, they use a very similar methodology um, in how they do their own work. Uh, and so if you, he's, he's actually been a huge proponent of using theory, getting out, going beyond the numbers, um, and getting beyond just simple polls to really understand what's driving people's lives and, and what makes meaning for them. Um, so uh, again, not the only, but I think a smaller cadre of people. All right, I'm gonna pull us forward now to the vast and lovely world of generative AI. This is actually produced by Dolly. Um, this was my cover image, and this is the next one. I typed in anthropology, and this is what you get. Literally the first image that Dolly produces. Um, okay, generative AI. Uh, I feel like we are at another tipping point in information these days, and particularly how information is representing other people. And just as I was a little bananas about you know, the mom personas that were making me upset, I think we have an important moment where we need to sit and really think about what is actually coming out of these platforms and why. So um, I'm going to show you one more hilarious image from Dolly. This is the second one you get. And I thought, oh, it looks kind of like a young Radcliffe Road. Um, I still can't figure out what this is in the front of the image, but something like this all over there. OK, so what's going on with generative AI? Um, there's sort of three subsections to this section. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the problems are. We're going to talk a little bit about where I think in the generative AI process we could or should be playing. And then I'm going to highlight a couple really interesting projects that I've seen come forward and talk about where. And then I want to end with actually an open conversation about where, what can we do? Where do we see the opportunity? So Elon Musk, New York Times headline, <laughs> right? So there's the, the latest call is that this is posing an existential risk to society. There's actually just a big summit at Bletchley Park here last week about generative AI and AI more broadly um, with all the world leaders um, and really, again, trying to address that existential risk. I will remind people, by the way, there was a team of female researchers who said this two and a half years ago before any of these platforms were launched. And they were at Google. Women, um, I think a couple women of color on the team, were all let go for posting this paper, which was essentially saying, these large language models are a problem, and we really need a framework for how we're going to address this, because this is not going to be good if we unleash this on the world. So we unleashed it, and now they're basically saying, yeah, maybe that wasn't the wisest thing for us to do. All right, what are the problems with these models? Um, you guys have probably seen even more of this than I have, or seen at least as much of this as I have. Um, I'll give you some funny examples from the US. 
Um, we had an attorney who wrote an entire legal brief using chat GPT. The argument was right. Every single case was wrong. Um, fined by the court for literally making things up. And apparently we had had four female presidents in the US. Um, so they really struggle with facts. It is a predictive algorithm, right? Um, they really struggle with facts. That's also why uh, they really struggle with math, um, for the record. So um, there's also been some really great examples of embedded biases. Uh, so this is hard to read, but essentially it's like write code, write a code that will identify um, a good scientist, and the code is if it's white or male, it's good. If it's anything else, it's false. Right. So um, and that was uh, also out of chat GPT, I believe. Um, so this is what we're seeing on the language side of the spectrum, and then when it comes to the image side of the spectrum. Um, it's just as interesting and fun. Uh, there was one uh, a team of researchers asked uh, one of the engines to depict a black doctor treating poor white children. And in every one of the 500 plus photos, the children were black. It could, they could not get them to generate poor white children. There's a really wonderful article about AI and the American self, American smile. Uh, which really gets into the nuances of how and when do people smile in different cultures. If you've ever asked, it, what's the article? How to ask for a drink in, uh, is it oh, I, But it's a really old that. anthropology article. Yeah. I have order of beer. Um, and it reminded me of that because essentially the idea being that a smile is very much a social dynamic. It's a social behavior. Right? And to assume that this is how anyone would smile as in a different sort of social cultural context, it's really problematic. But when you ask these engines to generate selfie images of like um, you know, Roman warriors or Aztec warriors or Native Americans, they always give them this really interesting smile. So, which is an interesting contrast to the historical images. Um, this was a this was a, they generated Barbies from around the world. You can look up the article. Barbie from South Sudan has a, a automatic rifle. There's been huge critiques about Barbies from pretty much everywhere else that they're all pretty much white. Um, and, and I know, again, like this feels like spaghetti sauce, right? Like this feels like it's kind of like weight, but it gets a little more serious pretty quickly. So Bloomberg did a study with Midjourney. They, 14 professions and three categories of criminal behavior, um, seven high ranking professions, seven low ranking professions. Uh, and 500 photos for each. And then they had a team of researchers code them using a standardized skin coloring scale and uh, uh, presenting gender. Um, and it just, you know, the, the, the high paying professions overwhelmingly paying white and male, low paying professions overwhelmingly paying people of color and female. Uh, just to give some credit, Doctors in the US, 39% 30, of doctors are women, not seven. And engineers, 20% of engineers are women, not zero. Like, again, it's just not representing anything close to reality. Um, and the same continues on with representations of people who would be, you know, who had criminal convictions. 80% were people of color. And on it goes. Um, I'll come back to this in a minute, but it doesn't even have to actually be a problem to be a problem, right? So this just came out recently on the use of generative AI in the battle in, in the war between Israel and Gaza. Um, and uh, actually, somebody from AI was also in this article. So what was really interesting is the specter of generative AI is actually causing people to dismiss information that doesn't fit their own belief system. So there, are, you know, depending on what side of the, the conflict you're on, people were looking at images and, and assuming they were Gen AI, rather than it actually even being Gen AI, right? So uh, it's become a way that people are starting to dismiss stuff that is inconvenient or uncomfortable to acknowledge. Um, and I want to come back to Google, <laughs> the company that fired the man. But um, what, they, what Eric Schmidt, who was not CEO when they were let go, but uh, basically is, wrote a book with Henry Kissinger, odd pairing, but essentially calling for a framework that is helping to govern what these tools are doing. So, like, you need a philosophical framework, a set of understandings of where the limits of this technology should go. 
his general point is that this is moving far faster than anything we can actually process, right? This to me felt so much like what Radcliffe Brown was also saying, like we need a framework for how we're processing this information. We are moving faster than we are able to actually consider and it's having implications for people, right? So again, while Barbie may not be that big of a deal, this actually is a really big deal. So these are maps from uh, Sequoia Capital, which is a venture capital firm. This is the number of companies that were in the Gen AI space in October of 2022. This is the number in September of 2023. In less than a year, it has wildly expanded. What's really important to note is that most of these companies are designed to help you take those platforms and ingest them into your own organizational, government, or business processes. So when we think about how they are profiling people who are criminals, right? When these get into government systems and are using, you know, information to rank people, right? They're also now using a lot of these to create um, personas of people. Uh, they're also using them for financial decisions. I believe there was an article in the Independent or one of the, the London papers about how these are now being used to also make decisions on organ donors or organ transplants. Organizations. Uh, so they are going to become part and parcel of how we are all moving in our world. All right. The way that most of us think about these platforms is like this, right? There's a platform. I write a prompt. I get an output, right? So whether it's a Barbie image or financial advice from a bank, right, this is how we tend to engage with these platforms. Um, I just came from our big conference for Epic. We had so many platforms and conversations about Gen AI, but a large part of where they're leaning is in a handful of, it's, it's really focused on the output. How can I upload my field notes to these platforms and get summaries? How can we upload a whole bunch of photos from field work and get a general semiotics analysis? How can I use it to, to outline my talk for me? Here's a couple things I want to do throw it all in there and it gives me a much cleaner outline. Um, somebody described it as Google, but better. Uh, and we're starting, these last year, the two that I actually want to call some attention to, we're starting to see an anthropology of Gen AI, which I think is actually going to be really interesting and, and we'll get to one space where I think we really need more. Um, and um, the one that is most disconcerting for me is this concept of unreal informants. Right, so just as we, you know, the personas were being based on data, we now have people going in and basically saying, hey, Bard, or hey, ChatGPT, pretend you're a woman from Michigan who's 43 years old and has two kids. How will you feel about the political position? How will you feel about this healthcare offering? How will you feel about this brand of spaghetti sauce? Right, so again, spaghetti sauce may seem minor, but these things are moving in bigger spaces. All right, this is how Gen AI actually works. Um, it took me a long time to figure this out. I'm just really grateful I have some super amazing people on my team. Um, this is supposed to be a build, it's not gonna be a build. Uh, but the reality is there's a whole lot more going on in a lot of places <laughs> than we're even touching. And if we're at the output, we're probably in the wrong place, right? If you want to change the output, pay attention to what's coming upstream. So what I'm going to do in the next little bit is talk about why I've highlighted some of these areas and, and really sort of where do I see as the problem space and where, where do I think we can go from there. All right, let's start with the underlying data sets. Um, there's actually been some really good calls about what is in these underlying data sets, how do we change these underlying data sets, how do we change, because not only are they used to build the models, but they're often used to retrain the models. Right? So all of those companies that you saw that are trying to come in, they're going to use your company data to train these, train and refine what's coming out of the back end. All right. Yes, please. Um, you may want to come back to this later, but I wonder what you found as useful about um, the kind of sociology, if you like, of the underlying data sets. That's, thank um, you for that perfect lead-in. Oh. To my next slide. <laughs> That's a very good slide. But so, That's not good. 
This just came out, I think, two weeks ago, a week or two ago. This was a team from Stanford, MIT, and Princeton that developed the Foundation Model Transparency Index. It's a lovely and beautiful report. Um, I encourage all of you to go pull it up if you're in interested in this space. But what you will see is that this is really, the top line is their transparency around the data itself. Like what is in, what is building this model? The general response is the internet, right? And that's as transparent as most of these companies get. Um, hugging face, which is the second one in, is the best in terms of what they tell you, but even they only hit just above 60% in terms of what their, their ability to disclose the data that's underlying this model, right? Uh, so really problematic. <laughs> Obviously, we don't know what dates they're pulling from. We don't know if it's including dark web. We don't understand, like, is it truly the full range of the internet? Is everybody there? At what point does it start and stop? So really problematic situation with what is in these underlying data sets. And again, these are often used to retrain some of those smaller data sets too. So um, be aware of that. And also, as anthropologists, like not everyone's on the internet, right? There's a whole lot of life that's actually not even there. So this transparency is only half of the actual problem that we would all typically get involved in and think about too. All right, sorry. Um, all right, so this is from Chris Potts. He's a he's an interest, he's a computer scientist, but also dual trained as a PhD in linguistics. Um, and teaches at Stanford, and his big rally cry has been around what is in the training sets, what is in these data sets. So he, as he's teaching these sort of massive undergrad computer science courses, he is hammering really focus on these data sets because the more complicated they get, the less transparent they get, the harder it will be to actually even understand, are they doing what we ask them to do? You know, I think we've taken this concept of black box and just sort of, oh, okay, it just does this. And he's saying, actually, it shouldn't. You, know, you, can, you can actually understand some of what's going on in here. This isn't really a black box. We're just glossing over it so we don't have to understand. So, um, but he's really pushing quality and what are those underlying training data sets and, and really uh, trying to, to drive that. Okay, the second big place where we can play is in metrics and parameters. So my team member, Nikos, who really should have been a professor, uh, but I'm so grateful he's on my team. And the way he explained it to me is this. The prompting that we do is like the recipe, right? This is like, make me a chocolate chip cookie, right? The data sets are your ingredients. The quality of those ingredients will have an impact on the quality of the cookie that you get out. But your metrics and parameters are really your baking skill, right? So is it me who's making you a cookie? Is it the people at Ben's Cookies who are making you a cookie? Who is making this cookie? And what is their relative skill and capability of doing that, right? And the more we tune or hone that, I'm sorry, Ben's was a bit of a, a favorite of my time here a while ago. Um, the more you refine these and the more explicit you make these, the more you change the output. Right? Okay, I'll talk. I actually will get to you since I get this in a minute. I promise I won't share cookies. I'm just a huge fan of baking. Okay, so again, back to our transparency index. They score a little bit better in terms of model basics, which is how are these models functioning. But aside from three, three companies, all of the parameters and metrics are not, are not disclosed, right? There's only three companies that have fully open sourced their models, so you can see kind of how it's working. Um, so don't let these scores, you know, this is more like, what are the dates of your data poll? <laughs> so th this is a little bit different from what it should look like um, in terms of when we're talking about parameters and metrics. All right, so why do parameters and metrics matter? How many, do, do any of you have like a, an ML background or data science background? Okay, just keep me honest if I'm getting this wrong, all right? Algorithms predict a likely point in space, right? So that's essentially what they do. What is the next likely thing to come? The next pixel, the next word, the next letter, something like that, right? So what your parameters do is constrain how 
open or how, like how flexible or how precise that prediction is, correct? Ish? <laughs> okay. Yes, the, my understanding is that that's essentially what your parameters do. So when you are on one of the image generators and you've opened it to a more creative mode, it's opening that of when you force it into like, I want this thing by Dal, you know, by Salvador Dali or something like that, it will constrain those parameters and make this a tighter fit. So parameters judge things like precision, accuracy, um, all of those. And then your metrics gauge whether or not you actually hit that. Okay? So this actually matters in terms of what we're getting at that outcome. All right? So I'm going to come back to this again in just a minute. The third place that we can play is in this box. The reinforcement learning from human feedback. When I first started to get into this, I was like, oh, this is, the, this is it. This is like the place. We got to go there. This is it. Um, reinforcement learning is a way that you are training the algorithm to do something. You're absolutely right. I was totally wrong. And I'm with you on it. I get it. <laughs> um, and we'll get there in just a second. OK, so this is actually one of the absolute worst categories in transparency, which is the labor of what's actually happening behind the scenes here, right? Um, full disclosure. This is an almost $20 billion industry run largely on piecemeal task completion. So any of you have ever done that, I'm not a robot, find the bus, find the bicycle. That's exactly what a lot of this is. And while it might seem mundane when you're looking at buses and bicycles, it gets vastly more complicated when you're having to identify abuse or you know, decapitations or sexual assaults or any of that kind of material that floats through the internet because we haven't really thought about what are the data sets that we're pulling in. Um, it is a deliberately designed system to go where the lowest wages are, and it is designed to keep people on the platforms for as long as possible. They process about 150 image requests a minute. Or sorry, 150 an hour. Let me just go down. 150 an hour, which is still, that's a whole, like, I can barely get through those robot things half the time. I miss stuff. So I'm not sure how they're getting through. Um, it is. It is challenging work, and it is designed to be really grueling. And when it comes to the anthropology of Gen AI, I really hope somebody else picks this up. Um, so it is, yeah. So when we get back to this, like, how do we actually solve for this problem of creating better outputs and what is hopeful or harmful? I want to go to here. Uh, Mary Gray, senior principal researcher at Microsoft. Computer science does not have a framework for understanding really culture, society, people, right? But she said, we have to start with the assumption that cultural knowledge and representation are hard to model, right? They are, but what are you guys specializing? Exactly this, right? Which is why I want to see so many more of us at that front end. So here's what I learned about actually tackling reinforcement learning with human, human feedback. It will forever be a game of whack-a-mole. As uh, it's, if we can extend our baking metaphor, this is where you're taking a bite of 150 chocolate chip cookies per hour and deciding whether they're good or not. Right? I think uh, for any of you who are fridge bake-off fans, like that would even crash those judges. Right? It is just, it will forever be a game of evaluating output. If we're going to do this, we need to think about how do we model cultural knowledge and representation. All right, so I think that the biggest space where we can play is really in metrics and parameters and in the underlying data set. So what I'm going to do now is actually showcase a couple of examples of teams that are doing that and then open it for some conversation. So what would it look like to come back to something like this? All right, so Latimer launched just a couple weeks ago. It is being referred to as the Black GPT. It was a version of, of a large language model that was overtrained with under with new data sets on cultural histories, um, images, stories that are relevant and resonant to communities of color. And it is embedded and worked with scientists and, and researchers who are from those communities to really build and create a platform changing the underlying data sets so that you get better results out of that. 
Yes. Was that, did they use like OpenAI's model or did they create their own? I, data I think they, they think they started with one of the existing models okay. and then over, remember that second round of training down here? I think it was one of those. Okay. Second, uh, this is one where they've actually overtrained one of the models on academic writing so that it will, um, is it academic and scientific writing so that it will uh, be better capable of producing quality academic reports for you as opposed to some of what can come out of it. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. This is a really fascinating example from Columbia University. This is Peter Coleman's team. So this team studies entrenched, uh, sustained peace and entrenched conflict. And so what they did was actually start with the theoretical model. What do we actually know about what defines a peaceful society or a society that is engaged in ongoing conflict? So they started with that framework, and then they ranked all the societies across the globe around that framework, and then said, what would be an appropriate data set for us to actually look at? And they ended up in LexisNexis, which is all of the news publications, um, across the globe, and then started to see, are there linguistic differences between how the news is broadcast in societies that are have sort of sustained peace versus so those with entrenched conflict? And lo and behold, they are finding that there are. So interesting way of starting with theory first, finding the right data sets, and then using these platforms to sort of gauge what are the patterns in that data and what can those patterns start to tell us about the data. Um, so this is an ongoing project, but really interesting. All right, now we're going to move a little bit into how you change those parameters and metrics. This is a project of Salesforce AI. Um, what they did was actually uh, one of the guys, one of the people on the project is actually um, a linguist, uh, and basically said like all words are not just words. <laughs> There's you know, variables that go with words. It's like, why are we using this word? And how are we using it? And who is the intended audience? Right? All those things you learn in discourse theory and, and so on. Uh, and so what they did was actually come up with um, more parameters that you can actually toggle when you are generating speech, right, uh, within the large language model. So right now, like I said, in the image generator ones, they have like a creativity index. So what this one does is rather than having just one, they give you 50. So you can look at like who are the entities who are involved, like what is the, the scenario that we're doing, and, uh, and it might seem quite complicated, but what they're actually finding is it's a much better generator of actual like real, um, uh, sort of, sort of true to life kind of outputs than what you typically get out of ChatGPT. Um, so another interesting way to kind of think about how we would go after this. Um, here's a random idea I had, so feel free to shoot this one down, but kind of building on some of those other things. Um, this is really building from sort of cognitive anthropology, where we think about uh, yeah, yeah, think about the <laughs> public culture discourse, like uh, what could we start to think about as the relative sort of layers of officialness, if you want to use my bad term there. So the newspaper articles might be what we would consider public culture, right? Uh, whereas Reddit might be something more like discourse, right? Like like an, like a personal model of how I'm processing something in the world, right? And how could you start to really think about the multiple ways in which we all navigate information and experience and start to tag things differently in those models so that when I want to do something more official, I can, oh, actually the other thing about the Salesforce thing is it told you what the driving data source was, which is really unusual in any of these models. But you could do something similar here and say, like, I only want stuff from vetted news sources. Or I actually want to see what's happening in the broad scope of public opinion. So give me everything from Twitter, X, Reddit, Facebook, whatever. But throw it at me. But you can actually start to segregate out like the contexts and the ways or the occasions that are driving the kinds of things that we get back. Um, this one is from my team member, Nikos. He's like, oh. If you really want to change the output, change your metrics, right? So in reinforcement learning, right, you can actually punish the algorithm when it gives you something bad, right? So here we could take everything we know about intersubjectivity, about power, about um, uh, uh, 
the power hierarchies and basically look at words and categories that tend to be problematic, right? To job postings, all kinds of you know financial algorithms, right? And you punish the algorithm, meaning you tell it, don't do that, if it gives you something like, oh, a CEO is a white male, right? You tell it, think better, think bigger, and it will learn to give you, learn, in, in quote quotes, learn to give you different outcomes, right? So that's how metrics work to force different kinds of outcomes. Um, and that's the concept behind reinforcement learning, is that you, you train it to do something quite different. And he's like, if you know, you can actually see where there are those really entrenched, um, I'm losing my words, statistical relationships, statistical correlations, thank you, right? Uh, you can see where those entrenched correlations are and then you break them using the metrics. So that's another idea. Um, semantic density, so this is really about understanding context. Uh, for example, vaccine hesitancy for people with COVID was quite different for vaccine hesitancy around measles vaccinations in the US. Understanding context and understanding the drivers might be really interesting. Uh, David, thank you for this beautiful word. I did not know this until I read your book. It's graffiti, right? How do you, the traces of missing data. Great example from my own research. We knew you could pretty much figure out when child abuse started in a household by a kid's math scores, right? Math is a compounding discipline. When abuse happens, their brain checks out of school. So you can start to see when it happened based on where they stopped learning math. Right? Horrible example. I appreciate that. That's why I don't do that anymore. But how could we actually start to look at traces in data? Like what would actually happen to make this likely? What would be, what would make this make sense? How do we start to interrogate the outcomes? more knowing that not everything is on the internet, knowing that the internet is actually not pulling a whole lot of money. How can we start to really think differently in this space? Okay, here we go, last slide, I promise. All right, so I'm gonna partner your British thinker with one of our very own Americans. Um, Twain has this famous quote, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does run. Right? So we started in the early 1900s with a world that was awash in new information and really struggling to figure it out. I feel like we are having these repeated moments as our technology advances, and we will have more. And I'm not saying, let's go back to structural functionalism, but there is something to that rigor. There is something to the idea of a framework that allows us to think through vast amounts of data in a different way that I think was really compelling and what he was trying to do at a very high stakes time, right? So if we're at a parallel moment, what could this actually start to look like now? So that's where I'm gonna end uh, with some huge thanks to a lot of people. Huge thanks to my partner who's next door with our son listening to this so I could come and do this and who's listened to me talk about this over and over. Um, and uh, to all of you for coming today and how do we fix this? Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are well people are thinking. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me just, there's a wonderful irony with your last quote. Okay. Um, a few years back, I actually tried to look up the source of Mark Twain's quote. Oh, did I get it wrong? No, this is what okay. everybody says, but he never actually said it. Ah, oh, what did he say? Something I'm quite close, but I, I have, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll look it up. I but saw it, multiple versions. Yeah, it, and it's it's an interesting anticipation okay. of ChatGPT mangling quotes that actually- <laughs> Data source. Is, yeah. <laughs> There we go. Data yeah. sources matter. Thank you for calling that out. I yeah. did see like multiple versions of it. Like, yeah. I wonder which one it is. Yes. I took a gamble. Yeah. Good to know I was wrong. Yeah. Well, you're wrong in very good company. <laughs> okay. So um, that's given us all sorts of di things to discuss. Um, thoughts, comments. I'll start. Thank you, Ray. Okay. Yeah. So, well, I mean, um, I also discovered this foundations of model, uh, foundation models transparency index, and what's what's really apparent is that it's somehow 
computer scientists. <laughs> and I love computer scientists. But, but they're not people. But, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that came out the wrong way. <laughs> I mean, what what they've done is that you know they've done what computer scientists are very good at, which yes. is you know taking a bunch of categories. And the nice thing about this is that um, uh, I think that there's a next step there because. The thing that you're trying to get at in the slides that follow it actually um, can interrogate that because what you really want to do is, is look at in detail what those models consist of. Yeah. And I don't think they have the way to do that yet. And I don't think even if they even if they could list them, they would know what to do with them. Uh, so I think that's you pointed us to the frontier, but I you know, I got there a couple of weeks ago too, and you know, I was amazed. But it's uh, it's just a, it's a very small step. And I think what's interesting is a couple it, that to me kind of raised a couple of things that I've been toying with as well. It's like they keep talking about more parameters as somehow a better model, and I'm not always sure that more parameters makes a better model. I, I don't. This is where I've definitely hit the limit of my understanding of machine learning. Um, is you know is eight billion parameters better than forty of the right parameters? Um, and that's a question that I would love for somebody who's actually vastly more who is a computer scientist who can actually help think through some of that. Is that a, a question that we we've really interrogated? Um, the other thing that you brought that your comment brought to my mind was the the where where you tend to see social scientists playing in machine learning is in the field of ethical AI. Or responsible AI. Um, what's worrisome to me is hints that some of those teams are getting closed down. Um, and it's not worrisome per se because I feel like we're not going to, I think that they're, in calling it ethical or responsible AI, we signal that something else is irresponsible or unethical. There's a, ling a linguistic toggle there that I think is really challenging. Whereas if we're really trying to look at who are we talking about? Who are we talking to? What is the use? Like, what are like who are the people? I think it can can start to pull us out of that space a little bit of feeling like we're the judge and jury of the companies that we work within. Uh, but um, but I think that there's more there, like you said, with the transparency index. Like these are all there. There's something they're circling around something, but I haven't quite figured I, out all the details. I mean, I have. I think you know there are teams that are getting closed down, but ethical AI, in terms of the, the number of humans who could pursue that uh, topic on the planet, is exponentially increasing. For sure. You I'm know, just thinking the number of companies that will hire the people who right. are. Well, I think you know, another way to do this is that I think the companies themselves are thinking this will do us good if we have more ethical AI, and that is going to be how it resolves itself. In one way or another, but hmm. that's just my. Of course, it might be ethical sense. washing. Sorry? Might be ethical washing. Could be very much so. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Lily, are you going to advise us if there are. Yeah. yeah, there aren't any at the moment. Okay, I'm cool. Keep chat. your eye on them. Thank you. Um, I'm a field researcher in terms of like AI and its impact on society, so I have no anthropology background whatsoever. That doesn't make you a bad person. <laughs> Thank well, you for I being assume, here. I appreciate I it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I kind of disagree with what my friend was saying. If I look at the field of AI companies, and I just, uh, when I look at like my master's degree, which was in AI, and where people are going, and who's concerned with ethical AI, and who actually has computer science in background, close to zero. And like the funding and all the research institutes that goes into something that's intersectional, meaning they actually, so like if I look at like, Europe, like the EU, mm -hmm. there's like one lab in Amsterdam that has the word intersectional on its website, and that's like the most progressive and intersectional it ever gets, like in terms of disciplines. And I went to that lab and like uh, like uh, researched with them, and it turns out there's like literally not a single sociologist in this lab, or like anthropo not even anthropologists or anything. Like they just do have like some words, and they still do very mathematical approaches. So I don't think that's a problem that solves itself because the funding is. Also, the whole AI Institute there, and most AI Institutes funded by big companies with like zero interest in like anything ethical or whatsoever. Maybe for ethical washing, yes, for sure. 
but not actually giving that power. And like the people you were talking about, it's like Tim and Gebru, like who was like fired from Google for actually like being one of the first POC women at this company, was fired because she like produced like not nice results for Google and like. I don't. I don't think this solves itself. I really think this I think solves, it solves itself. I think we really need to change this. It solves itself in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of the one of one possible place is as more people are trained in this, we're able to look at this in a more sophisticated way, right? The average person, you know, the average person, meaning, you know, you guys will have vastly more training in this than I certainly do. I'm desperately trying to learn from my much junior team members. How all of this is working and i think that that will raise just the general level of sophistication so hopefully that you know that's where people will start to call out google and start to call out some of the other companies it's not a solution i hear you i'm hoping you know is is what is that intersectional space and how do we use places like the oii to build create sustain those intersectional spaces and actually show that you can do something really different that works so what would happen, and this might be starting at the wrong end, but if you said that the bit on the flow diagram where you've got the people using Mechanical Turk to do the machine learning, yeah. uh, the feedback, the um, I'm not a robot bit, yeah. if you said that we will not pay exploitative wages, we will pay good wages for that bit of work, um, you know, at least US or U European minimum wage, um, that will change the whole economics of how this it system would. work. It would. Work. So a lot of these systems are already struggling to keep financially afloat. The compute, I didn't even get into like the environmental cost of running this and the compute cost of running all of these and that those are a whole other terrain that i think are worthy of study for anyone who's interested in that um but the the financials of paying somebody two cents for something you know for let's figure over 60 minutes right you get what's like two dollars a day i think of the going wage for a lot of this work versus what's european wages um, it's 11 pounds an hour here. Okay, so if you then assume 90 pounds versus one pound, it's going to be, it, it'll, I think the systems will collapse. This is my guess. Because right now they're, they're trying to figure out how to monetize this. This is what happened when social media, it, that, that's also why there's so many ads on Facebook and Instagram and all of that. Like they don't have a sustainable business model. The model is your information. Right? And if they can capture your information, they sell your information, right? And when you flip those problems, like that's where these can become challenging. Um, I am a thousand percent behind that, let me be really clear. Like I, I think that would be a, a definite start for how do we create a sustainable ethical model where you do this. I also wonder how many people would willingly look at or review what is coming out of some of these models. So um, I think there's a couple of questions that we need to need to address, but but it would definitely change the business model. I think it would also push more for integrating these into private company systems and government systems where they become like Salesforce, where it's a monthly subscription to have this, and they would be very expensive. I'd love to be wrong. So if somebody else has a better handle of the business model of these, this is my my general sense of what would happen. Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah. It's a lot of um, different things that you presented. I think you have a very alarmist tone in the end that is very much overlapping with a lot of things we do. Mm -hmm. um, um, the general story, uh, something you could just piece it together. So you okay. start with your activity and you show that the persona that market uh, researchers do uh, are kind of a bit fuzzy. And uh, I worked many years as a research manager. <laughs> I did the opposite. I first started working in qualitative market research, and then I came to anthropology. So I also so yeah. And then then you show us that with statistics you can get better personal. I have this quote of Mark Twain that comes up in my mind, but I don't know if Mark Twain, Mark Twain really <laughs> but he said something like Internet there is there is small lies, there is 
big lies and there is statistics. Oh yeah, lies, mm -hmm. lies, and, and statistics. Yeah. Yeah. So and I was thinking, yeah, actually the magic of statistics is that with with with, with figures you can tell any kind of stories basically, and uh, you're very aware of that. So I'm pretty sure that when you when you showed your your business partners that you could do personas with number, they must have been super super happy because you are you are you kind of bring even more power in, in the game. And uh, but I'm I'm still not absolutely sure how you know good personas like good qualitative research, good ethnography comes. Well, of course, you come up with good personas because that's the format that you want in the end because it's operational or actionable or whatever. Mm -hmm. But these are not necessarily worse than this. I mean, I don't know exactly. You know, that, that's my feeling. And then we move to AI mm -hmm. and to the fact that well. The biggest danger that you presented, well, there is lots of dangers that you presented, but one of the dangers that you identified going through this story mm -hmm. is that we might be able to do personas from the AI data sets and that this persona will um, kind of orient many of the decisions in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, But then you also say that, um, that, yeah, that AI is not Google, so you cannot trust the, 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 the things that AI spits out because it's just not how it works. It's not. So okay. I just my, it's my question. It's like because uh, I believe that there is a lot of hype. There's a lot of people saying lots of things about mm -hmm. AI. Sure. But when you start using them a lot, you realize how they work. Yeah. And then you realize it's not like Google. And you start doing other things with these things. For and sure. then you and then the, the this BI well, of course these models are BIs and you know it. So you start working around these BIs and do other things. And the question is. Yeah, in, in, the, in the end, it's like the, the, sto the story with the persona and AI is a danger because of the information and the BS that is inside of the, of the, of the data. This, I, I don't follow you. So, like, uh, yeah, so okay. is, it, is it the story? Because <laughs> so, um, I think that the story of this slide is less around the statistics mm -hmm. than it was around how do you think differently about people beyond demographics, mm -hmm. beyond. I, I think with both personas and the, the Gen AI, large language models in particular, I think what they both do is give you a good 30,000 foot view of a person, mm -hmm. right? So you've got a pretty generic, <coughs> high level, yes, in some ways would I have loved recommendations for better workflows, of course, right? But that doesn't tell you anything about what motivates my life. Right? But we still use ethnography in anthropology and it's For sure. Just and we used to do some of that. The challenge for most companies is that they're unwilling to do that. And when they are looking at a $20 million corporate bid, yeah. and I've come to them and said, I talked to 20 people, trust me. Mm -hmm. it, no matter how good the ethnography, uh, they are right to be cautious of what your data is, particularly when your data is showing them something that is unusual or unexpected. Right? You probably had many presentations like that. Well, usually then you go to quantitative and then you just prove what you just, right. you know, the categories that you, that you find out. Exactly. So, so this is what you did, you just do ethnography and then you prove it with the data? We did them in parallel. Oh, okay, okay. So we were doing qualitative work as well. And, and like I said, we joined these programs. We tried to get insurance. We, we had a project that was on gluten-free back when it was really hard to be gluten-free. And we all went gluten-free for a month and you know, didn't need a weight loss program after that. Um, it was, but, but really trying to do lived experience, trying to talk. We spent lots of time in home with people. We spent lots of time doing online diaries and platforms and all of that work. Right? This was intended to be a different way to use quantitative data, right? To kind of give a broader perspective, to give a different, not just to give the broad pattern, but to show nuance within it, yeah. right? And so in kind of looking at some of this mid-range theory about, all right, well, how do I, you know, what is the social life of things in my world, right? It, it allowed me to to create groups of people that that get lost in in the broad swath. I think if there's one critique I could make of all of you know whether it was data sciences or Gen AI is that it gives you a thirty thousand foot view of people, right? We're losing outliers. We're losing leading edge. We're losing kind of the the people who who are not right in your 
kind of cone of significance, if you want to call it that. But you're speaking about Gen AI, that's something that gives us a view about the world, right? That's yes. what you're doing. Right, right. That's, that's very kind of, the, the, the word I tend to use is truthiness. It's not wrong, mm -hmm. but it's also not useful, per se. It's very, um, it's very generic. It's almost a caricature. And that's where I, I find these systems. I I probably added a little drama thinking you guys are serious people and you're probably wondering why somebody who has the background I do is coming here, right? But I do think there is actually some genuine concern when these platforms are being integrated into systems with people who aren't computer scientists, with people who don't have a background in social anthropology. We're putting them in and not asking what do they do. Yes, when you use them a lot, they do become pretty. It's like, oh, this isn't going to tank the world. But if you're using it for that versus if you're using it to decide financial algorithm, you know, who gets finance, who gets loans and who doesn't, you are tanking people's worlds pretty clearly. And they're using them for medical diagnoses. And you know, they, they are moving into higher stakes terrains. And that's where I would suggest that that being a little bit glib about them is maybe not in our interest. Um, I'm happy to have a longer conversation yeah, about so how I think the general thing was I'm trying to show there's an arc to like in these moments of big data structure helps structure can help to process and understand and provide nuance and context for when using it. Okay, there were two questions online. Okay. Yes, I thought I'd just read them to you and then I have a question after. Okay, sure. Um, so Yule Wang says, hi, my question is that if there is any chance that the digital ethnography can help improve the situation we mentioned before, thank you. Mm -hmm. So for sure. And I think that we've seen a lot of that. And you know, we used to use online diaries. We did tag, uh, you can give people, uh, we use a platform now called Bscout, which people runs through people's phones and they can go and take images and stories about everything that's going on in their daily life. Um, you can certainly, there's a lot of other digital ethnography techniques and tools about searching what people have or about getting them to collect information or share information for you. Yes, all of that helps and all of that is important. Mm -hmm. um, when you are, you know, it, I think those are all complementary to different ways of also thinking about large data sets. And I, I'm not trying to posit, like, you can do this and you never ever have to talk to a person again. That would be the wrong way to think about this, right? This was, how do we take a framework that is designed for qualitative research, continue to do qualitative research, and back end it with some, with some quantitative work that we have some confidence is decent, right? So um, for sure, all the digital, there's some really wonderful digital ethnography techniques out there, and, and definitely agree that all of those are an advancement and, and should be used. And then Savannah Milton says, coming from an archaeology background, would you be able to go back briefly to the point on digital graffiti slash digital traces and elaborate a bit more? Sure. This is uh, actually, I'm going to thank David for this one because this was a term I didn't know until I read his book. Um, the concept, and, and you'll probably be able to explain it even better than me. Oh my gosh, this is, there we go. Um, there have been some interesting things about how do we understand the thing that came before what we're seeing in data, right? So Don Nafis, who was at Intel for a long time, did a really wonderful paper. Uh, she, she was one of the first people to like biometric herself <laughs> and really look at her, her own patterns. And one of the things she noticed is that when her data came back on Tuesdays, her calorie count was like triple what it was on any other day, right? And so in trying to understand what was going on, she was like, oh, Tuesday's date night, right? So they would go out to dinner on Tuesdays and obviously have a, a, a much richer dinner than what she ate the rest of the week, right? So how can you infer something like that story from, from data? This, the case I was talking about was something that we talked a lot about in, in the field of, of child abuse, is that understanding when something started, like this is all the causal inference work that's also happening at the intersection of like philosophy and data sciences, Understanding what's driving something can be really complicated and also where I think bringing in sociologists, topic experts can help frame that. Um, so uh, my, I spent the first two decades essentially of my career working in the field of child abuse. 
And like I said, you could typically tell when something started in a kid's life or when something went wrong in a child's life by where, um, where their math scores were, right? Because of the way math is taught in the US, it builds sequentially on each other. So if you miss long, if you miss multiplication, right, that's typically second, third grade, you're going to have continued problems through your academic career that all center around multiplication. Um, and uh, so it became a way of thinking about how do you look for these traces um, that, that aren't actually in data, but have to have happened for that data to be the thing that it is. Um, I would love to hear how an archeologist <laughs> might approach that. I know that that's really their area of expertise. I have this much background in archeology. span um, but that concept of any, you know, and we know this even from the way we do field work, you jump into a field site, right? There's stuff that's happened before you got there. You never show up into the launch of something, right? Something's always been in process. And a big part of our work is not just figuring out what's going on, but what came before and where is it going, right? So a lot of our own techniques, that's why we read historical documents. That's why we talk to people about what happened before. Even That's why we, we don't ever just do one method, right? That's why we are broad and comprehensive in our work. And so I think that where we could also bring value is when we're looking at some of these data patterns, how might we make sense of this using theory, using qualitative methods, using something beyond what we're looking at to, to understand why it's spinning the way that it's spinning. Um, and I, you know, if there's a more, I, I'm, I know archeologists have a number of ways in which they tend to approach a lot of this work and would be really keen to see like what would happen if you paired an archaeologist with a data scientist or with a machine learning person? How might your metrics change? How might your parameters change? How might your sense of what you're getting also change? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's really, like I said, it's a provocation, not, not, a, not a final of, of where is the space where we think there's actually something cool that can be done. Um, the other thing, a lot of these models don't uh, constrain by date, right? So what you get out might be from Two weeks ago, it might be from 20 years ago. And, and understanding how those things influence, I think is actually a really important thing that we haven't done as much of. Yes. Yeah, I guess that, that just throws up a question. Sorry. Oh, oh sorry. I'm no, so no, sorry. No, 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 no. No, um, no, it's fine. Sorry. Um, um, I had a question, but it wasn't so much to do with um, Gen AI, more to do with your please. own personal career trajectory and what you think the differences have been between being an anthropologist within academia and being an anthropologist in an industry setting and I suppose the, the difference that kind of jumps out for me is like why are we doing the research and for who and who's kind of gaining from the data that mm -hmm. we collect um, and how you kind of reconcile that. Um, so for sure that is the biggest difference um, you know what, what we study when we're academics is largely our choice and largely the gift of our advisors and what they encourage and inspire and enable us to do. Um, but when you're in industry or government or organizations, nonprofits, all of that, you are usually responsible to an end stakeholder. And that will shape your work. Different companies work very differently. I am incredibly lucky at Toyota Research that we are required to continue academic publications, required to go to academic conferences, required to maintain all of that. And, you know, we still do IRB, we still do all of the kind of rigor and setup of traditional academic work. We just are funded differently. Um, but, and Toyota sets broad scopes around, like I said, I, we're around harmonious communities, but how we go after that was up to my team. And the way that we continue to pursue it is, you know, is really moving the needle. The second thing that's different about industry, um, in my experience, is the ability to take what you've learned and do something with it. Um, I think where I really struggled, uh, partly I, I'm not sure I chose the easiest topic in choosing child abuse, but then to teach it for 10 years and not like be able to do something to fix it was hard. And, and I'll leave it at that. Um, and what I love about my work now is the mandate to fix it. 
right? So yes, we are watching in horror what's going on in a lot of the U.S. But how we fix that, like that's my, that's what we get up every day, and we're like, oh, what now? Like, where do we? What's the next thing? What's what should we try when we get? Um, and to me, those are things that I really love about the work. It's not for everybody. I agree. Um, and not every company is my company. Let me also be super clear about that. But um, but I think that it's been a wonderful experience for me. That's great. So. Okay. Thank you. No. Yes. Oh, simple. Yeah. yeah, I just had one question. You hinted, I can't remember what you were saying, but you kind of sparked it in the last mm -hmm. point you were making, which hinted towards like the kind of temporal aspect of some of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And I guess whether it's like personas or clustering, yeah. there's a real like time is really important there. And you were talking about feeling like, you know, the persona thinks I'm this, but I'm not that persona. But there's another aspect, which is, well, maybe I was that persona, and I now don't want to be. Yeah. And I guess that, like, in some or ways... Or maybe I am, and I don't want to be. Exactly. Yeah, I guess that, like, <laughs> in some ways, moving towards ever better model moves away from that. But at some point, I wonder if, like, ethnography and big data can't be resolved. And I guess I was just wondering about the kind of mm. the time, if you had any thoughts on that aspect. You mean, say, because our work is sort of much more dynamic in time, and these are all snapshots? Yeah, potentially. Um, or trying yeah. to get better understanding human motivation and kind of. I yeah, for sure agree on that. I think that that, but to me, the first thing that sparks in my brain is, ooh, that would be fun to solve, mm -hmm. right? So so definitely not. Um, I I do think that you know I always think of ethnography as like a film and a lot of this sort of pure point snapshot, yeah. right? And and how we think about that as. Um, you know how how you how you blend those two time modalities. Um, uh, that's where a lot of my re recourse to theory came in. And when I moved to industry, it's like this is just like this is this data is so limited. How do I give you a bigger context around this? And by situating my own or you're situating our findings within you know other theorists or other work that's where it started to get a little bit more of a life um, you could argue that most human problems are not new problems right so as much as we're talking about like oh gen ai right wasn't the printing press kind of like gen ai <laughs> um, and how we think about all of these things can be recursive through time as well um, but i would love to continue that conversation about like what do we do and how does it work that'd be great so, yes. Yeah, I think it's just a follow on from what other people have said. But I, when you showed the slide about kind of motivations and uh, uh, I can't remember which one. From was, back. Fam family motivations and people who are close. Oh to yeah, them. the yeah. Let me. Yeah. Try and get there this way. But I guess a comment that just reminded me a lot of Danny Miller's work on shopping. Uh, and, you know, uh -huh. the idea that you can focus on the shopping basket, you're actually looking at all those relationships. Yes. And that's the ethnographic way into that yep. question, I guess you could say. Um, and I guess my follow-on question to that is, is similar. It's a very general question. But anthropology, it seems to me, or at least people are discussing the problem of communicating anthropology uh -huh. to others. Uh, so I'm just wondering, from your perspective, if there's ways in which you found that you, you, you've been able to do that quite successfully. I guess it's falling on from your comment yeah. that it's hard because there's other agendas, and what is ethnographic research, and who's got the time to do that, and the sample's so small, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So I'm just wondering if there are points where you felt that, that anthropology really resonates with some of those non-anthropological audiences you've been working with, uh, um, you know, or yeah, optimistic, pessimistic, etc. Yeah. Now, I think, let me think about it uh, in a couple ways. Um, the point that I've been trying to drive home of late is that is, as the social as the kind of social sciences within industry are increasingly leaning towards behavioral psychology, right, mm -hmm. or behavioral sciences, right, that um, they're just looking at, like, well, what's the behavior, and, and, and it's very much, or it's a, like cognitive neuroscience. It's very much in my head. Right, and and my point is that the anthropology is one of the few disciplines that still sees people as deeply and inherently and always social, right? And all of these things are very much social choices, social decisions. So we had a team that was working on carpet choices, and I'm like, and for whom, <laughs> right? Like 
broaden their scope. I'm not like I might write the check, but who else is behind me who's got to get in that car? Um, or who am I, you know, showcasing to because I want them to see the, you know, a certain me. Um, so in reinforcing the social dynamics of our discipline, um, to me, that's been a really important part. The second thing, and this goes back a little bit to your question, where I think the Gen AI and data sciences are really good is that, like, what is the big pattern that we're seeing? Where field work will always trump is what's the outlier. And if you aren't attending to what your outliers are, you're missing big risks, right? You're, or big opportunities, right? It does not have to be doom and gloom, right? What is the next space? Where is it going next? And, and that's where, that's only something you're gonna get by being on the ground and paying attention. Like you can't see that, that these are designed to show patterns, right? They are designed to screen out who's on the fringes. And, and the more we can ladder ethnography and like, qualitative work and, and teaching a way of seeing and being in the world that attends to the, huh, that's unexpected. <laughs> that's where I think the real magic lies for how we, you know, for starting to get these two disciplines to really play better next year. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Before we end, I have got the Mark Twain quote. Oh, and, <laughs> and, and you will see why okay, it please. is systematically misrepresented. What he actually said was, History never repeats itself, but the kaleidoscope combinations of the pictured present often seem to be constructed out of the broken fragments of antique legends. Why does this feel like Levi Strauss? Yeah, I mean, it's great, but, but it sure does run. Well. Also, the final thing I wanted to say, um, picking up to this, the thing about how do you make predictions. Mm -hmm. um, that's what social roles do. Yes. I meet someone and they are, I am told they are, um, say, an uncle. By slotting them in the slot of uncle, I know how to behave to them. I know what my expectations yes. are. And then it gets more serious, well, more serious. It's different. I mean, it doesn't have to be kinship. I'm picking right. up kinship yeah. first. But receptionist versus boss. Exactly. The way I am taught in this society to behave to those different categories of people, very different, different expectations. Mm -hmm. And that gives all of us frameworks for generalizing and working in our lives. And of course, uh, that's how, what anthropologists have been studying for our Well, and that was years. actually one of the big points for Ethel Brown, which was like, yeah. stop talking about people, talk about the roles, because yeah. the roles perpetuate over time. Yeah. You've got to understand the relationship. And as Radcliffe Twain said. Yes, Radcliffe Twain. There we go. Thank you. So, thank you very much. <laughs> um,